the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. What's on, guys? Right here. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. I'm Rob, and this is Michael. And today we're here with Sean and Blake Hoolan of Breezy One Sport Fishing and Storm Force Charters. Welcome back. Let's make this clear. <laughs> uh, you guys were actually here from the onset i think maybe like one of our first one of yeah Might no, they, were, no the, they, they, yeah. the first yeah, yeah they were the first uh guests we we wanted to have here for an episode which we're gonna try and redo again <laughs> we're gonna redo <laughs> this um but you know things happen uh technology goofs up and the uh, recording file was corrupted and so um first thank you guys for coming back uh to do this uh with us again and uh, considering now we are in the middle of winter and all that stuff, how's uh, you guys been getting any kind of fishing, any ice fishing, or uh, just kind of taking it easy? I mean, you as a captain, your time to just, is this your Just a time your to chill time? unload, Yeah, kind of regroup, go through all the tackle, all the rods and reels, and get everything ready for the upcoming season. Yeah, yeah, I figure out. Same thing for you, Blake? You, uh, I'm actually purchasing a lot of tackle to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Good time because there's a lot of stuff that just came in, a, a lot of stuff. Um, so, yeah, let, let, let's start talking about uh, the idea here of when we first uh, had you guys on, we talked about this whole idea of um, trying new things, doing things differently. And what's great about having both of you here, um, Sean, obviously you're a well-accomplished angler and charter captain. And, and here you have Blake, your son, who's making a name for himself. He's... Pretty much just, did you, you get a captain's license already? Are you almost done with that? or? Yeah, I've had it since I was uh, 18. Oh, so you've had yep. that. So so you were just finishing off all your kind of your first mating and learning everything and, and all that, is that right? Yeah, I've been first mating since I was like seven. And then when I turned 18, I started working for Stellar. And, and here you are. This. Yep. And now, but now you're getting your own boat and everything, right? Yep. That's that's the big thing. And and so it's cool. And we thought, me, me and Rob were talking about this, like, you know, this is cool. It's very unique um uh because of both of you guys situation and the relationship and all that stuff to really discuss the idea of um especially blake being a, a younger guy in the sport um how do you approach all the kind of fishing that you're doing uh, obviously your father's been doing it for a while you know and and kind of the idea of what you've picked up for him and and others that you've you've worked for right um and um basically how you're developing your fishing here um, in particular, the things that you do that are, are, are a bit different from from uh, from what other folks may be doing, even your own father. And uh, so, so with that being said, uh, we'll start with Sean first. Actually, um, what has it been like to have your son and see him kind of rising through the ranks of what anybody would want to do to become a captain and all that stuff? Um, what's that experience been like for you? Frustrating at times. <laughs> really? <laughs> I've had, he's really taught me to be open-minded because what I've learned is there's more than one way to go out there and fish. And uh, when he first mates for me, or basically when he's on my boat, I'm the first mate and he's running the boat. Okay. I find, my, I find us almost arguing a lot, you know, where I want to do things the way that I want to do things. He wants to do things the way he wants to do things. But we always seem to find this happy medium. You know what I mean? And he's actually taught me a lot of new techniques that I wasn't open-minded about. That This is going to be my 35th season this season working in the charter industry. And uh, he's ap actually opened my eyes to a lot of techniques, a lot of things that I never even thought of. You know, as, as far as bait presentations or how far I'm stretching stuff behind the ball, um, Lots of different techniques. We can sit here all day and talk about some of the things he's taught me. Yo, which I think we're definitely <laughs> going to pick into because, I mean, I'm sure people are going to be curious because they might want to try it themselves. Um, it, it, the challenge with that is, though, is, right, you, like you've got a program. It's effective. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing the business you're doing. It, it works. Right. Um, when, when do you find yourself saying, you know what, I'm going to try what – he showed me the other day versus what I'm normally doing. What are the circumstances or the, the times that you decide to f switch it up? When he texts me and says he has 20 plus fish in the cooler and I got less than five. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty, that's a, yeah, that's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good one. So, so Blake, where, where are you picking these things, these ideas and these, um, these techniques from? Because I guess when we look at the landscape for information out there for salmon fishing, um, 
there tends to be a lot of the same information circling around. Not that it's bad in any way from people that are um, sharing that information whatsoever. Obviously, it works. But where do you seem to find those ideas? Is it just from being in your in your boats? You, you, you brainstorm with other folks. Kind of w- walk us through the process of how you're coming up with some of the things you're doing. Uh, just, you know, working for everybody. I've pretty much worked for everybody in North Point, Kenosha, everywhere, and then just trying things when I'm out there on my own. You know, if something's not working, try something different. And then if it works, it works, you know. So, you, you're, so you're learning from each of them, and then you you might take one of their ideas, piece it together with somebody else's, and, exactly. and you're making yeah. – could you give me an example of something like that that, you, that comes to mind, the most immediate comes to mind, something that you picked off from a couple of folks and you – you basically, we call it the yoink and twist. You <laughs> yoinked their idea and twisted it just enough to make it your own. Uh, probably the most important thing is messing with your speed. Okay. So I learned that from Bill, actually, from Magnum. You know, sometimes if they're not biting, just kick it up real high and then just cut it back right away and you can get bites. Or sometimes, you know, do like one five, one six, and it works. I remember the first time you here. <laughs> I was going to you were going to talk. <laughs> we're going to talk about this. What's really interesting that really kind of caught – me and Rob off guard was this whole idea that he goes relatively slow compared to what most uh, boats are going, right? You remember yeah, that? especially what the trend the last few years has just been to go faster. Right. right. You know, so to hear somebody going like old school kind of speeds like Lake Trout or even slower than that speeds was pretty interesting. So walk us through what, what speeds, what speeds, what are the scenarios under which you're going, you're, you're, you're kind of. Uh, implementing the slower speed technique is it all the time certain conditions not all the time but you know if if it's a tough day and i'm you know going normal speed like that two three to two five and it's not happening i'll try kicking it up a little bit and then if that's not happening that's when i just slow it down and try to get it to work you know just mess around with it any any idea in your mind why that will work no (laughs) (laughs) it's just one of those things you just just noticed it right you just kind of noticed it um Obviously, the idea of kicking up and then cutting it back is the whole thing of speeding up the bait and slowing it. And they might, if they're following right, tr- it'll trigger them to, to yep. swipe at it, the, the idea. Kind of the same simulation, I would think, is swerving and turning yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, you're, you're, you're normally going slower than most folks in times. Um, you still running the same kind of spread? Do, do you change your spreads? In order to um, fit the speed, or how, how do you? How's that look for you? Uh, I usually run all my riggers super tight to the ball, okay. so it gives them, you know, like a tighter whipping action, and then everything else is pretty much normal. Got you. And so for folks that uh, to kind of understand it, it's really interesting because when you bring it tighter, because you're going slower, it, it makes it rotate probably what equally uh, if you were sending it out further. Is that the idea? Yeah. If, if it's a little more aggressive action to the the dodge or the flasher or the spoon or whatever because you don't have the laziness or the belly in the line right as if you would if you were stretched back say like 100 feet what do you prefer to have your your, your rigor spread out stretched <laughs> <laughs> way out there you know there's like if i'm fishing lake trout on the bottom say with a paddle and a spinning glow everybody's go-to on the bottom i'm 150 to 200 feet behind the ball wow but doing that i've learned that i can kick up my speed cover more ground and my philosophy is i'm putting my lure in front of more fish because i'm covering more water presenting my lure to more fish where blake has the opposite thought of you know he wants to get every fish that looks at his lure to bite you know and i you know i may only get one out of three to bite he wants three out of three to bite do you think maybe the 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 way you approach it slower tighter to the ball might be or maybe let me word this right have you noticed it say you're in a you're noticing you're in the schools of fish, right? You're in the you're in the area where the fish are. You're constantly marking them. Do you notice that uh, that slow rotation tends to get you? You'll mark them, and you're like, all right, we're good. Usually, we're kind of get like, that translation there. Usually, like when you're coal fishing, for instance, and there's schools, I usually don't go that slow because okay. there's times, like for instance, last year I was actually fishing the hill, and uh, I would check baits, and the coals would be chasing it to the boat. So I text him, I'm like, why can't I get him to bite? And he said, kick the speed up. So, you know, I kicked it up to like two six, two eight, and it just started going down. Started going off? Yeah. So it does depend on the species then, right? Right. We are talking about that. Because you were mentioning the like, Lakers down deep. Right. That, that person. Do you, is it a challenge to run it that far back for anybody that's, that, you know, maybe a small boat, small boat guy or whatever wants to try and do this? What, what are some of the um, things that they need to kind of take into consideration if you're going to run those long? Those One of long, the biggest. The biggest things that I've learned when if you're running those long stretches behind the ball, 
is running braid. Because if you're running mono, and let's just say, there's a lot of times we're fishing the bottom in 250, 280. And if you're running mono all the way down to the bottom, and then 150, 200 feet behind the ball, you could drag a 15 pound trout and never know it, uh-huh. you know, cause they're just not gonna move it. So, you know, we'll run 150, 200 feet of um, fluorocarbon usually, and then tie that to braid and have braid going down to the release. And it's, you just don't get as much blowback and you can see every single bite. Got you. So then you still have like the fluorocarbon kind of benefits of that. And then that braid just gives you that attention. So the detection, right? So you can see the bite. Correct. Got you. Got you. Is that similar to you? Are you running your riggers kind of in that, in that fashion where a floral lead into a braid? Yeah, pretty much. Got you. Unless I'm running like a light line spoon or something, I'm running braid on everything. Got it. Got it. Um, one thing I want to mention too, uh, I want to talk to you about your your brown fishing, the way you kind of brown fish. I think this is another opportunity we, we, we were talking about where it's you're going slow again. Um, what, what, what are uh, some of the techniques you're using to, to, to target browns in those situations? Uh, usually all spoons, but I like to run like a, a white hot spot with a white howie, like right off the bottom. That's saved my <laughs> life. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Spoon wise, what were some ones that you you, you kind of lean on to get, to pull one in that uh do usually well for all you? stingers, and okay. then sometimes uh, a good one for me has been the moonshine bloody nose the UV one. Yeah, I've caught some browns on that one too. What about uh, remember that day on the water? Remember uh, what was the uh, what was the spoon? Everyone was screaming on the radio. The hot lobster. The hot, the hot lobster. lobster. <laughs> did, you, did you hear that story? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hot lobster story. That was a good one. Um, so bloody nose. Yeah, that that is a good that's. That was a good one. Um, how about you, uh, Sean? What, what, what? For browns? For browns. I caught one brown all year long. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the hottest spoon that worked for that one brown? I actually caught it on an orange Dodger and a two-tone peanut fly. Really? <laughs> <laughs> was even a spoon. I'm more of an offshore guy. Yeah. You know, where Blake up in Kenosha, he has, you know, it seems like they get more browns in the shoreline than mm-hmm. we get in Winthrop. I mean, we get some in Winthrop, but you got to go further south or up by... Kenosha and Carthage in that area by Blake and uh but I, I I'm an offshore guy I mean the further offshore I could be the better you, you really enjoy it right I love it absolutely it is it's, it's, it is really nice when you're away and the, the horizon is this big or even not even visible and no cell phones no cell phone service uh yeah there's times we're so far out like I had a trip uh two years ago we turned we were 36 miles out i couldn't even hear anybody talking on the radio 36 how deep were you at 36 oh uh, we were in the low to mid 400s jesus what is what is it uh you know like i've been out in salt water we've been out 20 some miles you're a thousand feet out and you're like you know to the point where you see um cargo ships container ships and naval vessels sure right what what does it look like in your electronics when you're out in lake michigan 400 feet of water is it is it anything special about it It, you just kind of it's just so so much water there not a lot of structure um the water on average is typically a lot cleaner out there you can easily see the schools of bait in the top 40 feet of the water column a lot better on calm sunny days um i tend to always mark more bait out there now it's not always alewives there's stickle back and there's i i find that there's a lot of baby perch that live out there as well what's what do you think the reason that's i'm curious as to why they would just venture off into you know any rhyme or reason that I mean, I'm not a biologist, but right. I have to think they're out there feeding on plankton and things like that. Oh, bring it more fertile, maybe? Yeah, Is that kind yeah of there's maybe? definitely shrimp and plankton and all sorts of stuff. And it's, that's kind of where you'd always find baby perch. It's been, yep. you know, but in the past, you just didn't go out to 400 for it. You see it in 200. Exactly. You know, yep. pushing yep. it further. Um, and uh, when you're out that far, I mean, all the species are out there. You get your. your That's your, what I like about being out there. You, no, you don't always go out there and catch big four year old kings, you know, 20 pound plus kings. But what's nice out there is it seems like there's always something to catch, you know, whether it's cohos, uh, lake trout, rainbows. You, it's more multi species. May not always be the bigger fish, but my numbers seem to be pumped up out there. Is it, uh, do you find the bite easier? And by that, I mean less pressured fish, so they're more inclined. Absolutely. To, so you're. Yeah, there's not 20 boats working a school of fish. It's typically just me. Just you, right? And so if just... you you know you get on a spot where you get two, three, four rods go, I can typically mark it, and every time you go through it, you're going to get multiple bites. Where you know when you're fishing the hill or inside a 200 foot, and you can see 50 boats around you, everybody's beating up on the same yeah. couple of schools of fish, and they're breaking them up. Yeah, yeah. 
How about you, for you, Blake? Have you have you ventured out there as a captain by yourself? I'll, I have not. <laughs> Probably the farthest I've went is like uh, 290, 295, okay. right in there. Yeah. Any any um uh, any scares you you've, you've experienced so far? Because I, the reason I ask you is because it you know um, it's so new. I I, I would imagine. Uh, when you're first starting off and like think of any profession when you're first getting into it you know you're excited you're also nervous you don't want to screw things up and all this stuff and so you you know you got this boat it's very expensive <laughs> uh all that goes into it you're bringing people and so their 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 safety's in your hands um you know talk to me about the pressures and the the feelings you go through um as, as you're, you're going out there uh, i mean there's a lot of pressure of course but you know, just trying to make sure you have everything in order, ready to go. Everything's in tip-top shape so nothing breaks. You know, you don't break any fish off. And then just making sure that people make it back safe is a whole nother level of pressure. Yeah. You know? You've had any any, any um, scares on the water, is, you know, broke down in the middle of it or any, any kind of? Not yet. <laughs> well, let's hope not, obviously. I mean, we, we don't want that to happen. But, um, I, I, well, Sean, you've had a lot of years on the water. Any 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 moments where you're like, oh, my God, I'm glad we, we got back? You know, because things happen. Storms roll in out of nowhere. You, you know? get the little pop-up storms. Like, the most recent one pops in the mind where uh, I was out fishing a low 200s, and Blake actually texted me and said there's a big storm about a half hour away. And I'm like, oh, that'll be fine. I got garmin live weather you know and i'm watching it and it didn't look terrible but then i took a second glance at it and it was turning purple on the screen <laughs> and i'm like we gotta go and about the time i was starting to power up uh captain caleb from the migrator he was in the marina too and he was calling me and saying you know you better haul ass and it was literally the wind was so bad it was moving the dumpster in the marina wow and uh i'd say the wind hit us when we were in about 150 ish somewhere right around there and uh, the wind gusts were reported at 81 miles an hour at the uh, at the airport here in Waukegan. And, you know, do I get scared? No. Nervous? A little bit, you know, but you got to stay calm, cool, collected. Because sure. you start panicking, and that's when things go south. Right. Because you, know? you were out there with clients, I'm assuming, that day? Oh, yeah, clients on the so, boat. So <laughs> <laughs> what was their reaction more than anything? Because, you know, obviously they're looking to you. Because the moment they see you panicking, they're going to lose their, you know. Yeah, I, I just kind of go over <laughs> with everybody. I just tell them that now is not the time for everybody to be standing up and walking around. Sure. Everybody just stay seated, and I'll get us in safely. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's that's uh, that's always good. Um but it, you know, it kind of comes with the territory when you're out. Any any one of us, you yeah. don't have to be in, in the business. You just leisurely fishing, and it can completely turn on you. Um, Rob, did you have something for me? I actually to go back to kind of where we started. Is there anything when you and Blake have been fishing together that he tried that you just shook your head and was like, "That's never going to work." It ended <laughs> up working really well. I gotta sit and think about that because there's <laughs> been many of them. <laughs> Boy, that's a tough one. But we go a circle back when it comes to mind. We'll give you we'll give you a moment because it seems like he's he's uh, throwing a lot uh, a lot your way. What would you say that you've picked up from from your from your father? Everything, <laughs> pretty much. You know, he taught me everything I know for the most part, besides what I've learned from other people. You know, um, from me forgetting what leader lengths to tie and him reminding me every year. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I don't think you mentioned this. Uh, talk to us about the boat that you're going to be running this year. Well, it's going to be a 36 Tierra with eight ones in it. So, um, fully equipped with Garmin and Magnum metals. So hopefully it's a good boat, you know? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> it's a big <laughs> boat. Yeah, for sure. You sure? You excited? Yeah. Nervous. You got your first kind of locked up or uh, yeah. locked in already? I'm sorry. So far. Yep. When, when is, uh, season start relatively the same, right? May is kind of like yeah, usually the window. The first week of May is when we get going. Get going and all that stuff. So right now you're spending most of your time just, you know, the, everything together, Prep, checking the boat. Yeah, spooling reels, getting reels. Oh, man, you know. listen. <laughs> you don't have to tell us about spooling reels. We, we've, we've perfected that. Um, uh, Blake, I want to ask you, uh, being younger in the sport, and we, I think we all know and, and can admit that um, our sport itself tends to lean older in terms of, of folks involved, and we always want younger people to come in. So, one, it's, it's, it's the whole idea of passing on traditions and the knowledge so we don't lose it and, and all that stuff. Um, also, it's good for the, the industry. We need to have a kind of cycle of people coming in, support obviously local businesses and the charter services. So you always want people to kind of come in and, and, and funnel it in there. Um, 
for you and kind of like looking at your peers and your friends and all this stuff, are you finding more people getting involved in um, in this kind of fishing? I don't want to say generally just fishing, but because salmon fishing is its own unique kind of a thing. I would say not really. You know, a few, but not not too many seem interested or they didn't even know that there was salmon and trout in the lake. You know, I get that a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> you know, you get that the most if you. So I grew up in Chicago, so you know, be on a lakefront fishing. And you'll pull in a beautiful smallmouth. I mean, you catch anything down there, right? Perch, big drum. And it, it's hilarious when people are like, oh, my God, there's actually fish in the water? <laughs> oh, like, it's so cute. Why would there not be fish in this giant body of water? Right. Um, but to your point, yeah, people might even know that it, it, they're even in there. Do you do you try to get folks to get in? And Yeah, I do. Like, I, I supply a lot of the captains with first mates just because I'm younger and you know, when I was in high school, I would get everybody working, and it, you, sometimes it works out, sometimes it don't. You know? <laughs> of course. Okay, so you've been like the point man for uh, getting first mates there, huh? Try to. That sounds like a, that sounds like a side <laughs> business right there. You know, like a, a, play, a placement agency operation. There. there. You go. Um, so for anybody, let's say, you know, this is to be a first mate. What would you say uh, the ideal first mate um, looks like in terms of age in terms of qualities could you describe that maybe somebody watching might be interested in that i mean if you're just starting out like i would say 12 would probably be my youngest you know as long as you have a ride to the boat of course yeah. but um you know then you can learn how that captain wants that stuff done and then you can just be the best first mate he's ever had you know because yeah, ev everybody good. does everything their own way sure i was gonna say 13 is probably a good starting age you know okay the, the biggest thing with a first mate my opinion is a kid that's dedicated enough to be there an hour before sunrise and be there till an hour after sunset, seven days a week at times. Yeah. You know, finding somebody that truly enjoys fishing enough to do that. Right. At that age. Right. At and, that age. You know, when, when you still got um, video games and sports that they might want to play, it's a, it's a real um, big ask for sure. Oh, yeah. What, what would you say, um, Sean, as, as far as uh, characteristics or, or, um, or whatnot of somebody that, you people know. person you know because the the biggest thing in the charter industry to me number one is safety number two we're an entertainment business are the people paying to catch fish absolutely they're paying to catch fish but we're an entertainment business you know the people want to have a good time as much as they want to catch fish you know if you go out and you stink it up and you just catch a few fish say three fish with six people but you show them a good time and they have a lot of laughs they're going to come back you know, versus even some of those customers where you take them out and you catch 20 plus fish, but you're an ass on the boat, they're not going to come back. You know, number one, they, they want to have a good time. So that first mate has to have the personality to carry on a conversation with the customers and answer questions and, you know, not be tired or just sitting there on Facebook the entire time. The, the, you know, kind of, I get the idea when you say that, right, it paints the picture. It kind of reminds me of like a bartender, right? Yeah. Or like your barber. Uh, these are kind of professions where your 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 service and all that stuff, but then people come to you and inadvertently are like you're their uh, their prom impromptu psychologist. They're yep. dumping, oh my wife, <laughs> man, oh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, just or, or the corporate clients, you know, that are coming out. Uh, you know, the the boss is entertaining some high end clients and stuff. They right. want it to be a professional enjoyment experience. You know, it's not always about how many fish are in the cooler. For sure, and having a good time. Um, Blake, um, favorite species? Which, which, what's the one that you, when you're out there, you, you, you know, you have the most fun targeting and, and catching? Uh, personally, probably steelhead. Just you know, they put up a nice fight. Uh, they jump. You know, they put on a nice show, and they're just all around fun to catch. Is there any one of the species out there that you find to be, out of all of them, uh, the most difficult for you to, to get on board, for whatever reason, uh, compared to the other ones, right? Probably browns. Browns. A little tough time. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder what his answer would be. <laughs> <laughs> browns. Well, not only it's catching browns, but sometimes they can be the hardest fish to get to the boat after they bite. You know, and circling back to something that Blake has taught me, maybe he can talk about. He actually a couple years ago helped me with my landing percentage on browns because I, I text him. I'm like, dude, we're like 0 for six, and every fish has been a brown. It hits the surface and it's gone. And he's like, try this. And I, we ended up killing like the next eight in a row. I'm assuming try this was in, was purposely said 
Try this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. I'll ask later off. We'll turn off the camera. I'm wondering. Um, but no, Blake can talk about it because it's this is his thing. Well, if you if you want to, I'm just well before that. I mean, the idea is that because of their mouth, right? So right. Yeah, they're, it's real hard and stuff. Spin so. smaller, you know, smaller mouth. Yeah. Hard, but they don't always hit real hard. Yep. They you don't know. get it buried down in the giller aches. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, uh, don't have to answer that if you don't want to. No, I will. Uh, oh, you will? Okay, sure. Actually, Rich Tanner taught me it. You just, you know, when you get them up to the surface, you want to, like, angle the rod almost um, parallel with the boat and keep it down. So, they're, you know, their head comes up and they're thrashing and you lose them. Oh, so almost like the idea of, like, a, like what you would do for a bass, right? When they're yeah, going to yeah, come exactly. up to the surface, you just want to yep. point the rod down. Point the rod it, down and then, like, the parallel side. with the transom of the yeah. boat, you know, and try to keep their head down below the water. And that's the problem I was having that day is they were coming up and doing that gator roll with their head mm -hmm. up out of the water, and the hook would come flying back, you know? Yeah. And then he told me to try that, and I've never tried it in 30 years. And I had the customer stuff in the rod tip in the water and then, you know, parallel with the transom, and we killed every fish that hit after that. Nice. Nice. Um, let's talk about kings and specifically uh, with the overarching theme here about trying new things. What's some some things, some techniques, um, or and or lures that um, you've been using or you have used that's different from or not normally used by other um, anglers out there? Uh, when, when we talk about targeting kings, obviously kings are the most prized on the water. Sure. Um, so so for you, what is what has that been? I don't know if I really have one that nobody else is running. You know, I, I like to run. Or even just not many folks are running or not normally running, you know, because I understand that there's not a lot out there that we're not using, right? It's just that it could be that one color that rarely sees the light of day from the majority of other people, but you're it's your number one and you're use, also using it. Or... Uh, frog Howie on every rod. <laughs> <laughs> just straight and just a frog on everything, no matter what? Pretty much. No. Or like a... Uh, what they call it it's like the frog but it's got the what's that material the mirage in it yeah mirage so frog. The super frog yep. super frog oh the super frog yeah slight variation subtle yep. but it but it's enough to notice so so you're it's just straight up frog super frog white each chip with a frog howie and a wire dipsy it doesn't leave my rod all year really? at least that one you know i leave one of those out year round no matter the time of day. And everything else is, you kind of change depending on what's going on? Yep. What's your normal spread look like? Uh, You know, summertime, it's usually like one wire dipsy aside, three riggers, and two or three coppers aside. Cast you off on the planers? Yeah, depending if it's rough or not. And yeah. then sometimes like a 400 or 450 down the chute. Okay. Because you, you still got three riggers, so is it you got one down the chute and two out on the yep. corners? Exactly. Got it, got it. And then... uh lead cord is just primarily in spring is you usually like that transition like that first week of june is when okay. i'll start running leads got you up until we get in that heat summer where like this this year when we had they went out or no it was like warm all the way down to like 80 yeah. 90 feet remember it was yeah. like yeah that was a really um interesting time to fish for sure um okay and and so uh the frog fly with the white e-chip on the wire dipsy that's your like king kind of rod, like you. Yep. That's the Go one you're, you're just leaving in there. <laughs> yep. How about for you, for you, for well, you Sean? He, he did talk about one before this podcast in the store that I it made Rob chuckle that he didn't mention. And honestly, I like how people, I, I like how people have the, the, the information changes from out there to here. And honestly, I hadn't heard of it either. Him talk about it, and it made me chuckle. So. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, chrome stubby with a white howie. <laughs> but <laughs> chrome you stubby. said it was a half cut white howie half behind a chrome howie. stubby. Yep. Half cut, you like you cut you trim the, the skirt yep. down? Trim the skirt like almost in half, pretty much. So what is that? Like that's like what, two inches? Two inches. Yeah, so it's like a almost almost peanutty, not peanutty, but uh like a two inch slider. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Behind oh. a chrome stubby, he said he was killing the kings on it last year, and I didn't hear a thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Where are you normally running? Are you putting that on a copper or uh, your usually, other dipsy? Usually putting it on the center rigger. Like okay. when we're fishing that, you know, 80 to 100, I'm running it like just off the bottom. Okay. And how, how far do you normally run that behind your ball? Uh, I usually stretch that one like eight feet, eight, nine feet. 
right off the ball. Stretch it to eight feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking. No, listen, he's really pushing the ball. When he says tight, it's tight. It's really tight. But yeah. that, that's a stretch. Eight feet. You're a maniac. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, that brings us. Remember, we were asking, "What have I learned from Blake?" Yeah, I remember another day last year where he was telling me he just killing it on his boom rigger down 15 feet. So I go down there and I, I just left the bait on that I had it on, brought it tight to the ball, knowing he's going to have it tight to the ball. And I put it down 15 feet and I could see the fly and the Dodger and everything. So I go back on the radio and I call him. I'm like, but I can see the fly. He's like, trust me, they're going to bite it. And before I even hung the mic up again, I was hooked up on it. Wow. So we, we literally stood there at the corner of the boat Watching and watched out in the water. And you could see fish hit it where in my mind over all the years I've been doing this, I would never run a bait where I could stand there and watch a salmon or a trout bite the bait. Yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, how did you stumble on that? I just tried, you know, the cohos were in like that. <laughs> slow, was it a slow day? <laughs> I'm curious here. On the days that you end up trying things, was it was it slow? Like you're like, oh my god, I got to figure something out. Is that the usually you know? But context? it can be good. But you may have two or three rods that aren't working. So then I'll just gotcha. start trying stuff so with those. So if you notice that some rods are quiet, you're you're just you're doing something with them, right? You're changing something out, or you're flipping the rod out, or yeah, changing them. But you know, not going too crazy. Change it, let it go. You know, for an hour, forty five minutes, and then change it again if it's not working. So you, you would let it sit there for that long? Or that's normally about an hour? You'll let a rod soak if it... Usually like determine. 45 minutes. Gotcha. You know? It depends on how much confidence I had in the lure I put out. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering you got all uh, uh, frog howies out there, <laughs> I don't know which one is better than the other one. They're all the same. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so you... you I want to circle back on that, that stubby. that You said it's a chrome stubby? Yep. Not it's not not the trash can one, right? Which is the dull one. It's the actual the chrome, 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 yep. chrome. Okay, with what fly behind it? The half cut white howie. A half cut white howie, eight feet off your ball, and you just shot that down deep. You're usually like five five to seven feet off the bottom. That's interesting. You almost are you like, willing to share your other tip on how a, to get those to work? I was gonna bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> there's more than five minutes. Oh my god. See, I wasn't for everybody watching, I wasn't out there. I was setting up all this here. So this is news to me. So I'm generally like, I missed the info, man. I miss um the fine detail of the whole rig. Yeah. What is it? The the, 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 the the let me guess, the stubby's bent in half, right? Is that what it is? No, you gotta take the gold star sticker off. Oh, uh, <laughs> that, with that one and the smoke, <laughs> take the sticker. The off. little, I mean, the sticker is smaller than a quarter. <laughs> no, yeah, it's tiny. But it was proven because Blake was killing him on that setup, and nobody else could catch it. And then he realized the sticker fell off of his. So when he relayed that to everybody, everybody started peeling the stickers off. They started catching more. <laughs> we we are maniacs in this sport, man. We really are. I, I have to say that. Um, that, but you know what? That's that's such a cool idea, right? Uh, I don't know many people would have thought of dropping the stubby down because you know stubbies are a spring thing, right? We, right? At least that's what we associated with spring. By the way, we've got plenty in stock over here. <laughs> yeah, we're getting low on them. Well, yeah, yep. yeah, we know. Sorry, <laughs> by the time we're watching this, they're gone. They're just, <laughs> sorry, uh, but um, to, to you know, as you said that, what I, the the reason I find it interesting is that while everyone is putting down 12, uh, 12 inch paddles. And uh, or the bigger ones, or you know, whatever variation of, of paddle, you've got just the shorter, you know, that whole profile can, you know, obviously, my in my mind, it's working because it changes up the look, it's giving them something different, the right. wobble's different, it looks different, smaller, it's not as big and, and, and disturbing. So, that that's a super cool share. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what, what would you say, uh, Sean, has been something that you've been the that you 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 do now that you've been mo that took you a while to implement it dude, that that was you know because when we talk about being set in our ways mm -hmm. was there one technique or one setup or whatever comes to mind that you were really like Meh, and finally you gave in and you're like all right i should have i should have done this sooner i would say you know when i first started doing it you know our average spread would be I mean, back in the day, some of the charter boats I worked on had six downriggers on them. Wow. And now you got a lot of charter boats that run two downriggers. Some are three, some are still four. But uh, it was the fighting, the long line stuff for a long time. You know, you know, back in the day, if we ran a lead court, it was down to shoot, not on a board, and that was it. I found myself for years, you know, not uh, fighting that whole system of running 
four lead cores aside or four coppers aside, you know, and just getting stuff out away from the boat and getting more baits down in that target zone by using the long lines. Or now it's like, man, I wish I'd have thought of that and been doing that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it takes effort, right? I mean, it's, it, I think when you're first doing it and I started. Well, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's work. <laughs> it is work. Yeah. Cause well, I had my first. That's experience. why you have first mates. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're also right. Like, <sighs> or, you know, you just tell you grab, you know, 300 copper and tell a customer fish on right here, you know, and let them reel it in. It's like, oh, I got away. <laughs> That's not like a whole entire oh, episode. Why we got Tricks it of the trade episode. <laughs> why we got it in is might as well change the bait. Yeah. Um, in what scenarios do you find yourself um, pulling rods out and, and, and shortening your, your or, or lessening your spread? Usually if it's tough. You know, I'll try. Sometimes I'll only run like seven rods, six, seven rods, and that's it. You know, and then, you know, there's days you want to have. 10, 12, 14 rods out if they're really biting. But if they're not, I like to take less. Yeah. And and the idea is that less kind of disturbing the water. It's more subtle because you got less things in, in there. Right. right? And then, and that could be enough to, to get them to come in. And, and I, I think, <laughs> you know. No, I mean, yeah, there's definitely it, – it's been quite a few people have come in and have shared that, like, um, whatever circumstance – whatever circumstance it may be that they decide to pull a couple of the other rods out and then they just start getting bit. And right. it's, it's, I'm sure this is something you've experienced. Oh, we used to bash our head against the wall back in the day. I mean, how many times have you gone out there and you're putting baits in the water and while you're trying to get baits in the water, it's going down. You're yeah. catching fish. Yeah. You know what I mean? And some guys have thought, well, it's the temperature of the bait from the sun beating on it. So the bait's warmer. So we would, we tried you know, taking baits and laying them on the dash of your boat and getting them warm. Well, that didn't make a difference. <laughs> you know, and, and well, you're, you're trolling a little bit faster until your engines settle down a little bit and you don't have as much gear in the water, so try trolling faster. That didn't make a difference. The one thing that we found has made a difference. If you're setting up and it's going down, you can't even get rods in the water, and then all of a sudden we get our 14 or 16 rods spread in the water, and now the action died. Start pulling rods back out of the water, and the action starts picking up. That yeah, that that's really interesting how that works. Even 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 because when you think about it, I mean, if you're running uh, planers with copper or whatever else, I mean, they're way off to the side, and it still impacts the rest of your spread. And sure, because I think when people are pulling stuff, they tend to be what the the, the boards out first. I mean, they'll leave the riggers down, they'll leave their dipsies in, and it could be like their stuff that's on on the outsides, right? Or I don't know, what would you pull in first? What usually I'll start with like my inside boards. You know, okay. shorten it up. Um, but if it's spring, you know, I may pull a rigger instead of the boards because usually the boards are hot, you know. Gotcha. Pull a rigger, and then if that doesn't work, pull a dipsy aside, and then usually that does it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's pretty cool. Um, do you have some? No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I catch, my occasional check in with Rob to see if, he, if he's going. Cool. Got to make sure you're still awake. Yeah, make sure you got, that's why we keep it on. You're, you're there? You're awake? <laughs> um, okay. So as we continue the conversation here, um, let, let, let's talk about um, – I wanted to kind of – and I know we talked about, about this before. Um, 2021 is in the books now. How, how did that season fish for you guys? Um, did you notice any trends? Did you – you know, what did you think about the fishery, how it held up? Um, kind of give me your, your, your own recap and, and for how it went for you guys, respectively. Okay. Jumping up, whoever. <laughs> well, I, 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 we have to keep fish, uh, fish records, yeah. fish, fish logs for the DNR and send it in. And then for my own personal reasons, I, I tally it all up. And, you know, I do my uh, average of how many fish per trip, you know what I mean, based on how many trips I ran. And this past season, my average number of fish per trip was up in the year before was up before the year before that it just seems like the last four or five years it's been steadily increasing not a lot but you know over 180 trips you know it seems to be going up on average you know a few fish a trip yeah and that and when you think about the body of water that i think that's that's significant i would say sure that that's you know if you could recognize those differences yeah what, what about you for you i would agree with that you know it was pretty this year seemed like we had good sections of rainbows, and then this week we had kings, you know, and then cohos and lake trout. It seemed like it was just a really good all-around year. 
Yeah, didn't it really seem like every few weeks there was a, it, we were just going rotating and it was yeah, really there was evident. always something to catch and it was like really evident too. We, mm -hmm. we all knew like oh this is a steelhead time and yep. that was like the end of summer period right before the fall and you know then there were kings in this. Period. It was really defined. It seemed like and it really seems like our coho fishery at least in our area has been lasting later into the season the last few years to where it used to be that first week or two of June at least in the Winthrop and like Waukegan area done. You know what I mean? And now we're sitting until July 4th until some kings show up. Or now it seems like we have really good coho fishing with six-man limits every time we go out until right around the 4th of July now. It seems like it's really carried on three or four weeks longer than it used to. Yeah. I, I, I It was interesting for sure. Because I, I, I want to say normally um, – when I start my fishing, I start in the Southern Basin. So you kind of get the early springs that show up down the Indiana waters and I'll kind of follow them up. Right. And, and in years before it's always been Indiana, they'll scoot up through Chicago and you can still catch them out of various uh, harbors out of Chicago. And then they'll make their way up to this area and, and all that. But th last year, and I want to say the year before that, it's like they almost kind of skipped Chicago and it did seem like they stuck right. here. It's like they bypassed Chicago water water was come up and started settling up a little further north and hung out a bit longer, yeah. which who knows why, but it was definitely something I was. I think I some of it, you know, back in the day, it used to just be the coho grind in eight to 15 feet of water on the shoreline when the nuke plant was going. And even now down by the stacks where now it seems like them fish are staying more offshore, you know, feeding on freshwater shrimp and stuff like that. And because of that, they just seem to be sticking around longer where versus when they're in that shallow water, just getting grinded on every single day. Yeah. Projections and thoughts for for this year for 2022 is more of the same. Do you, do you do you think anything may change one way or the other? Well, I had an old timer that I grew up working for. You know, back in the late 80s through the mid 90s, and he used to always tell me when we had them colder winters like we're having right now, that when there's a lot of ice on the lake and it was really cold, that it always seemed to correlate with having really good spring fishing. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Because it, it, it was good the last couple of years. So, yes. I, and this this winter seems pretty much on par for the last few winters. We've had these mild winters. We get our occasional, you know, snowstorm, but nothing. I mean, I remember as a kid, we get snowstorms and things are like a week long. <laughs> it was brutal. Right. Like the reasons that my kid gets out of school now, oh, it's it's five degrees. I'm like, I was getting sent to school at five <laughs> <Exactly>. degrees. <laughs> they didn't shut it down. I was like, right. they didn't care about us as kids. Um but yeah, it's been fairly mild. We get a little snowstorm here, and then it's done. I mean, we've for the guys ice fishing right now. It's we've it's been a lot of good winter weather. I mean, yeah. there hasn't been a lot of rain. There hasn't been a lot of uh, so. I, I'm excited about that. Um, there was something I was going to ask about that too. Oh, I, I wanted to circle back. Um, this would be a good point to point out uh, to everyone watching that um, this past season we were we were. Um, uh, we were went on uh, Sean's boat, and uh, we shot a video with you, um, kind of just really inside look tutorial, and we did a couple of things. And I wanted to kind of recap that. I'll link to it below so you guys can watch that video. Um, but one of the interesting, uh, interesting points that you pointed out that stood out in my mind was when you, when we talked about bottom bouncing, yeah, and the idea that um, there's the thought process that you should only use like the round balls to do your bottom bouncing. And in, in that video, you guys will watch, he has a pancake uh, uh, weight, a uh, rigger ball, uh, whatever. And you were bottom bouncing. And, you know, this whole idea that it doesn't just catch Lakers. You'll catch uh, Kings, Cohos. Yep. And sure enough, pull, <laughs> pulls a Coho. I'm like, I like this call, could have not been the most. I called a shot. In the next yeah. It was a really it, nice one. Really, it, really, it, yeah, no, yeah. it was a really nice one, too. Yeah. It absolutely was. Um, could you just. Explain the uh, process on bottom bouncing for someone that's interested in it. I know it might not be the easiest thing to explain, but but kind of walk the, um, I guess the procedure of it all. How how you how do you go about doing it? Well, first of all, I mean, some guys give the the pancake weights. Are they the best bottom bottom bouncing weight? Absolutely not. But I run them on my booms. You obviously don't want to run a pancake weight on a rigger off the back of the boat because they're designed for running on your boom, sticking out the side so you can bend the fin, get a little bit more swing out, a little bit more spread. So I'll, I'll bounce them on the bottom on the side riggers, but everything else I use round balls off the back of the boat. But if I'm bouncing the bottom, the number one thing is, first of all, I'll turn around, look at my graph, see how deep I am. And then I'll be conscious of watching the counter on my downrigger 
And when I know I'm getting close, I'm getting ready to shut that rigor off because if you hits bottom and you're just in la la land daydreaming, you're going to start blowing cable off the side of the spool. But I'll let it hit the bottom and then I'll shut the rigor off and I'll give her about a 15 second count because you're going to start getting that little bit of blowback Blow where it starts rising. Yeah. And I'll give her about a 15 <laughs> second count and then I'll send her down, hit the bottom again. And then I'll give her about another 15 second count and then I'll do it one more time. And then that, that third time, I've found that it really, because I don't, I don't like, you don't want it dragging across the bottom. Right. You want more of just like a skip where it's just occasionally skipping the bottom. Say every, you know, 30 to 50 yards, you just see the cable or that downrigger rod tip just kind of tick where it's just skipping the bottom. And uh, obviously this is something that if someone's going to do, uh, it could go wrong, especially if you're trying to learn the technique. Yep. This is where I'm gonna come to you. This is something that, as as a as a a, ca a captain and all that, you, you want to have this in your arsenal. Um, how difficult? Any tips or tricks for someone that's gonna be trying this out? That's new to bottom bouncing that you learned uh, because you made a mistake in the process of it. Did you did you lose a whole setup? Uh, I've lost some downer balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. You just have to be careful. You know, when you're getting close, I like to like you know turn the rigor on, turn it off. And then just do that until it hits bottom. Don't just leave it on and let it slam into the bottom. You know? so like incrementally, just right. on and off, on and off. I think it's important to say here that having a good downrigger, uh, downrigger itself is an important aspect yeah. of this, right? Uh, any kind of specs that, um, um, I mean, I'm not the most you know knowledgeable in the area, but I, I imagine downrigger's got motors in it, right, that yeah. are able to do this. Is there any any basic things that people might want to know if they, if, for the rigger they might want to use for this? If you're going to be using a downrigger for bouncing bottom a lot, I mean, working at Magnum Metals, I have the ability to run fast motors, slow motors, whatever I choose. And I've found that the slower the motor, the better. You know, because when that ball hits the bottom and you're not paying attention and that rigger's moving at 200 feet per minute, shit goes wrong in a hurry. You know, where if it's running – you know, at 110 or 130 feet per minute, you got time to recover before that bird nest comes off the side of the spool. Got you. So that'd probably be something for someone new, go with a little bit of a slower motor so you right. can just have more control is the idea, right? A, a technique that I, my first mates, like my, I've had I've been fortunate to have a good first mate for many years, but if somebody's filling in for them and I'm working the bottom with a rigger, another tip that I tell them to do is when it's getting close to the bottom, I'll have them pick up on the boom of the downrigger and actually hold it in a pivoted up position, kind of like at a 45. And then you'll actually feel that ball and that cable hit the bottom mm -hmm. and then pick up the slack you pick, and then yeah. lower the lower the arm back down after they do that. So you can physically feel kind of like holding the rod in your hand. Yeah. You're, you're holding up on that boom of that downrigger and you can feel it hit the bottom. That's a, that's a, I think that's a really good tip right there. Yeah. That's a really good tip. Um, what are the, the setups that both of you guys use for bounce the bottom? I know you use the big 11 inch paddles, but I know port to port it changes a little bit sometimes in Kenosha. They use different stuff and I Dodgers. Mean, I use a little bit of everything. My favorite one last year was like a 10 inch spin doctor with a spinning glow behind it and then a uh, Kingfisher. Okay. Which which spin doctor? Uh, it was um, the Dragon Slayer. Gotcha. Classic. Yep. Classic. I was. I didn't know if we we're gonna get another stubby on that one. I was waiting for it. I was, I was waiting for the. Or no, I was waiting for the flash dodger. You know, the little action flash. Yeah, action flash. Yeah. Um, for you. You know, if I, it depends on what I'm fishing on the bottom. You know, if I'm targeting trout, it's a, you know big paddle, spinning globe behind. But uh, you know, if I know there's some silverfish down there with them, with them trout, um, you know, I'll still run that paddle, but I'll put a fly behind it with like a, you know a 34 to 37 inch lead behind it. You'll pick on the trout, but not as aggressive as you would if you had a spinning globe. But it gives you better options at the silverfish than running a spinning globe behind the uh, the paddle. Yeah, They'll, you know, out in the West Coast, ones out there, they they still run like spinning globes for their for their coho and stuff. Yeah. So uh, obviously, a coho will still take a spinning globe, but it just seems to be Lakers just are more prone to it. Oh, I remember. You know, this is going back in the day, but probably in the early '90s, the whole dock comes in. It was in the springtime. It was early May. Everybody got smoked. I mean, fishing was terrible for everybody. Here comes a part-timer rolling into the dock, 30 fish. <laughs> it's like, my God, he just spanked all of us. You know what I mean? Walk over and look at his rods. He was running spinning gloves behind his Lord Jensen Dodgers behind planer boards. Caught a limit of coals. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it, that's pretty cool. Um, 
because you see, there, there's certain things as, as we've had other guests on the show, we talked about the kind of the growth of the lake and uh, how presentations have changed over all this time. Um, certainly the lures, lures over the years have changed, right? Where um, we've had folks share with us like the early day flies made out of real you <laughs> oh, know, yeah. buck hair and, and all these kinds of things. They had like little lips on them and stuff. And I was like, so fascinating. Um, and then there was an era where the, um, uh, what do they call them? The squids, but they call them hoochies. hoochies. Yep. yep. The hoochies were, were a thing. Uh, I, I'm actually looking forward. I would love for you to take some of those hoochies out and see if you can bring them back from the dead. <laughs> that would be really cool to go out on the boat with you one day. In fact, here's an idea we should do one day, maybe before the full season's in swing, we go out on a day and we just run the most outlandish setups and just make a video about obscure things or things that we've haven't been using. Like, you know, people, people are not using squids like they used to. Um, what are some other things we can try the spinning glows for coho, you know, maybe on some setups, just some interesting things. Uh, Oh, like, um, back troll. (laughs) (laughs) In that big boat. Oh, that'd be amazing to see that. No. Uh, what are the things called? Uh, they were using out there in the West coast too, where you, you pack the tune inside of it. Oh, the brads, the The brads, brads. cut plugs, cut plugs. So like, that'd be cool to go out and spend a day just using off the beaten path presentations and see how it fares in our current like fishery yeah let's do it you be down for that <laughs> yeah. oh he said it right here we're gonna go on a day when when, when, when he don't you know has uh, nothing going on um that'd be really cool to do uh any other things that you're doing that other folks may not or not normally do um that just is a part of your program that uh produces for you consistency consistently uh, not that I, I pretty much just run basic stuff, but, you know, just do some tweaks to it. Yeah. Well, those tweaks are enough, though. Right. Because, right? like, it's the devil's in the de- details. Like the sticker off the, off of the, <laughs> you know, the sticker. I, you know, if people they- stop watching this video right before we mention that, they're out there right now like, God darn it, this is not working. <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's any other lures we need to peel the stickers off of. I, I'm peeling off That we just don't know about right everything. now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think what other lures have stickers on them. I'm, I'm peeling them all off. <laughs> it, it, yeah, the uh, flick sheds with the underbelly. You've got the written uh, the flicker. I'm, I'm scrubbing the name off. white out. I'm scrubbing <laughs> the name off of the bellies on the flicker sheds. Um, Sean, for you, what, what about, um, what do you think as far as something that you want to try or try more of this year that, that isn't something you normally do, that you want to put more time and effort into implementing is there something that comes to mind Oof, that's a tough one yeah uh and i get that it's like if it ain't broke don't fix it i, I subscribe to that all yeah. the time if it's not broke don't fix it but there is at least for me a certain grat- gratification when you try something that's off the off you know not normally used and it produced like f yes you know like, <laughs> hell yeah you know like it's a good feeling and then when you come back to the dock and they see all the fish like would you use it's the same old, same old, you know, yeah. and they, then they're starting to wonder, like, what are you doing out there? You know, I'll be honest with you. I'm, especially with Blake being younger, he's way more aggressive at like working the rods. And even though I got a first mate and he runs by himself, I'm not a bait changing guy. I have the baits out there that I have a hundred percent confidence in. And I'm more of a speed and angle guy, you know, where, you know, talking to Blake and uh, communicating with him and other captains. I know there's a lot of captains out there that, they're more aggressive about finding the bait where I'm more aggressive. I like working speeds and angle, you know, cause in my, I have a philosophy is if the fish is hungry and I'm presenting it to him, right. He's going to eat it. But if I'm not presenting it to him, right. He ain't going to eat it. Yeah. Really good point. I, that, that subject right there is his own whole conversation, but just to, for you to kind of briefly expand on that, uh, when we're talking about, uh, angles and speed i think most people have an understanding for the speed uh aspect but angles is such an important thing more um, important than speed at times so could you just touch on that and again i know this can be a whole nother thing sure. but just touch on that in, in, in so far as you know the importance of understanding um your angles in relation to current well what i like to see especially it's most visible let's say in the springtime when i got a a full spread of you know four or five planer boards aside I want to look back and see my planer boards on both sides of the boat tracking the same. 
I don't want to see one side swung off behind the boat a little bit more and the other side swung up to the side of the boat a little bit more. I want to find that angle where everything's tracking true. Because if you have one side swung out behind the boat and the other side swung out way to the side of the boat, you know, one side, those lures are trolling slower and that side's trolling a little bit faster, kind of like you're doing a constant turn. Mm -hmm. I like to find that angle to where everything's tracking true and straight and all my lures are running at the same speed. And a lot of that comes into play when we're looking at those currents in the water, not just the surface level, but if you're fishing, especially if you're fishing deeper, there's undercurrents as well. Right. And, and watching your, your, as you said, your rods to see that they're pulling. Yeah, because we'll get way. different currents at different levels down yeah. because one of the ways I set my dipsies is I just stuff them in the holder and I back the drag off and let them sit there and click and go out on their own. You'll hear it, you know, for 30, 40 feet, it's going out nice and smooth and steady. And then all of a sudden it's like it just stopped you know, cause that current changed. So then I got to go loosen it a little bit more and it'll start going back out. And then all of a sudden it starts screaming out cause it just hit a patch of you know, faster water, faster, faster water. Yeah. Right. That's really interesting. What, what would you say for you, Blake? Is that a, has that been a challenging part for you? Because I mean, what we're talking about here is managing the vessel. Um, you, you're computing multiple things, right? You're looking at your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, electronics. You're um, if you have a fish hawk, you're looking at that as well. You are looking at your you know looking back at your spread to see as as, uh, as you said about the everything tracking properly. It's a lot to kind of compute and do. Um, how how would you say that experience is as far as learning that um, as your captaining a boat has been for you? It's tough, but you know you just got to get out there and learn. That's one of the first things he taught me was just get everything running straight in a nice line. I have three riggers on the boat I was running, so I just watched the center one. You know, you can see the cable swung off this way or that way, mm -hmm. and I just got that running straight. And, and that would help, help to set good. the rest of your stuff right. up. Yeah, no, that, that's 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 pretty good. Do you have anything on this? Because I feel like you. you would no, I mean, I, it kind of answered it all. I mean, it's not just like a random. You don't go out and just try different angles until something works. You know, you're looking at your rods and you know that's what one the perfect v is always what i'm looking for as well yep so don't get then. me wrong i mean every day is a learning experience you know i come in here and i talk to rob and you know he'll say something to me and it's like huh and then i'll go out tomorrow and i'll try it or even if it's a bait that i never that just doesn't look good to me or you know it's it's any type of technique and every day is a learning experience you know? yeah uh one final question i would have for you both is this where do you think, uh, or what do you think would be the next kind of evolution in uh, whether it's a program or a technique that, that would be used out here? Because it seems like that um, we've got our standard programs and, and that's kind of it. Is there something that comes to mind or in what capacity would you guys see a next the next evolution or the next kind of innovation in, in salmon fishing Oof, that's tough yeah it is <laughs> yeah, i asked you because this is something we and Tim talking like i don't know I'm, like, yeah. I'm just gonna ask everybody else because they might have you know because you might you know your your perspective is different you know whereas ours comes from um prior experience and being at the shop and talking with other folks but it, it's i've seen everything evolve from the baits you know the paints that are used on the lures the spoons and stuff and the tapes on the flashers, it's all way different than it was back in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s. And, you know, now even downriggers, you know, we're running, uh, you know, back in the day, a heavy downrigger weight was 10 pounds. Now we're running 20 and 25 pound weights every mm -hmm. time we go out, you know. So it's the whole downrigger game has even changed to, you know, where we have to have, you know, stronger downriggers to run the 20 and 25 pound weights. And, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's just constantly evolving and it's hard to guess what's next, you know? Gotcha. Anything for you that comes to mind that might, uh, might be tough. the game changer? I don't, I don't really know. Oh, no. You know? Um, I can't think of anything right now. One thing that some of my friends have been talking about, a lot of guys trolling now, and I didn't think it was going to work, but a lot of guys are using like the panoptics and all that now for trolling. Yes. Yep. Now, yeah. that's something that, that I caught on wind. I think it started, I could be wrong. But I want to say one of the first videos I saw on YouTube was some uh, salmon guys out of like Ontario or yep, somewhere over sure. there I saw that, same video. that took the live scope and mounted it backwards and they could see their spread in the water and they were calling out fish. That that one's about to get hit right there. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. 
<laughs> and since, since then, I got a Garmin on my, on my kayak. I'm like, Rob, I should get one. Just I know. We keep, we keep talking about, do we really want to put one really of these on our kayaks on right now? If they didn't have a black box, oh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a great advantage because you can see if there's a lot of fish coming to your spread and not yes. biting. And then you know you're doing something wrong, yeah. whether it's bait or speed or angle or whatever. So. Yeah. that That is actually uh, maybe where it'll start getting out. I mean, we talked about right here. Someone might already have him. Like, oh, I'm going to do that right now. If you do, let us know how that works. I would love to see screenshots of your spread in the water um, trolling for salmon. If you do, send it to us on the uh, on the uh, uh, Facebook page of the shop because we would love to see it and maybe share it and give other folks a, a inside look at that because that that is really interesting because yeah. now you're real time watching your you know your your setup get smashed and or you'll see fish come up and turn on the same thing. You're like, all right, we got to tweak that whatever exactly. that is because. They're interested, but they're not committing. We got to change a color or maybe a profile. So that seems like maybe the most imminent thing. Um, but uh, it, it is going to be interesting to see what is it. You know, is it is it going to be a new paint on the kind of lures that we're already using? A paint style that's I don't know infused with whatever that you know. <laughs> I, you know but I mean, we laugh at it. But it, I mean, well, for instance, uh, Moonshine came up with those flashers. Mm -hmm. Interesting. When we first got it, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yep. So for anybody watching, if you don't know, uh, Moonshine came out with their own flashers this this past season, and they're interchangeable. So there's a um, there's a middle component. What do they call it? Um, the insert. The insert. Thank you. Yes. So there's an insert, and you could buy all the different colors that they provide, like uh, blue night, green night. Um, yeah, all the, a whole bunch of their yeah, different spoon. Yeah, patterns. all their spoon patterns, the colors that they make the inserts for them. And uh, on the on the flasher, you just pop the little things. You take the insert out, and you can swap it. So you've got three core colors: white, green, blue, and then each one has either the UV finish on the back or the glow crush. Glow crush. Anyway, not to be long here, but but what was interesting was like here we have like a small innovation right in this flasher, where and we tried it on that trip. Um, you can have one core color and then insert whatever other combination bloody nose or whatever and it gives it a different look sure and it you know rob and i were like i don't know what to expect but we're like <laughs> we caught some I'm, fish on yeah we caught fish i was like the one rod kind of like i don't know what we do wasn't really working i was like hey, rob can i throw this on there we, we got to try it for the shop anyway like product sure cool and, and it worked so i say that to say that it who knows right like these right. things and i'm looking forward to it because who knows where we're going to end up in the next five years as far as uh, the gear and uh, the lures and uh, super duper glow becomes a thing. Dynamite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Troll with sticks of dynamite. And as soon as you get close, just blow them up. Um, well, folks, I, I want to say another great con conversation with you guys. Um, and uh, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up here? No, I'm good. You good? I'm good. No, I think we. You know, did we milk all the secrets out of you yet? We gotta, we gotta ring them in here for a couple more. I'm gonna have to come up with some new ones. Come up with, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just don't come up with fake stuff. Like now you got to put two stickers on the dock. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a long. Uh, it's gonna be a uh, running meme now. Is the uh, the sticker thing? Um, but I, again, we want to thank you for coming back to retape this for us, and uh, uh, I definitely feel like uh, uh, this one. The first one was great. I think this one was even better just because we, we, we were able to kind of touch on some more things and get some more interesting stuff uh, out of the conversation. Uh, so, folks, if you want to get out with either one of these gentlemen and or both, which is uh, what I would do, you know, this is what I would do. <laughs> Book a trip and then go on the boat. I was like, oh, man, you know what? Your son, man. I was on with him. I mean, we got 10 coho. We got five right now. What's going on, Cap? Oh, yeah. You know, that'd be a good way to, to bust their chops and everything. <laughs> uh, we'll link to them down below so you guys can contact with them for trips, uh, pick their brains. They're both very um, knowledgeable and willing to share information as well and, and uh, um, great to uh, network with them. Um, so, Thank you guys again. Look forward. We'll have you back, of course. We'd love to have you back for, for future episodes before the end of this uh, first season of the podcast ends. And any other thoughts, Rob? No. Thanks for watching. There it is. Bye, guys. <laughs>